far side bumping us in on this Sunday morning. On Thursday, this country will begin an incredible new social experiment that I don't think has adequately received the amount of attention it deserves. When the citizens of Washington state will be able to buy and sell marijuana legally under a regulated system that is more liberal than that of anywhere else in the entire world. Unlike the 18 states in the District of Columbia that have allowed the sale and consumption of marijuana for medicinal use, on Election Day, Washington, along with Colorado, whose own law goes into effect next month, became the first states to legalize the drug completely. Just like they can with alcohol, residents of these two states will be able to buy, sell, consume, and carry marijuana so long as they're over 21 and don't drive under the influence. I'm talking about full legalization of the recreational use of weed. So now the conversation switches from what this law would look like in the abstract to how to actually manage it. In Washington, the law establishes a one-year period to develop rules and a licensing system for marijuana production and sale. The state's Liquor Control Board, which will regulate the sale of marijuana, says it has little insight into what to do. Things aren't as complicated in Colorado, where a tightly regulated commercial medical marijuana market is already in place. The Department of Revenue, which will oversee the sale of marijuana in that state, will likely build on the already existing medicinal model. Not only will marijuana be regulated in these states, it will also be taxed. Indeed, the promise of this new source of revenue was a major selling point to voters. In Washington, the state will tax marijuana at the massive rate of 25% three different times in the chain from production to consumer, which is estimated to generate a whopping $600 million a year. Revenue projections in Colorado are just a tenth of that. Of course, since none of this has been done before, no one knows how accurate the estimates are, but we're all about to find out. Joining me at the table are Tony DeCoppel, senior writer at Newsweek and the Daily Beast and author of the recent Newsweek cover story, The New Pot Barons. Kevin Sabet, former senior advisor for the Obama Office of Natural Drug Policy and now an assistant professor at the University of Florida's Drug Policy Institute. And back at the table is Dietrich Mohammed from the NAACP. All right. Kevin, I guess I want to start with you on this, because um, the big question before we get to how this is all going to go is what is the federal government going to do about it? Yeah. Um, it is clearly the case that marijuana is still an illegal drug, according to federal law. Selling it, trafficking it, doing all sorts of things are legal under federal law. And so now this huge question arises. And having worked in the White House on this issue, what is the Obama administration going to do about this? Well, I think the administration has been very clear that, you know, and the president's been clear that he's against legalization and that on public health grounds. I mean, we know with legalization we're going to have a cheaper drug, more people are going to use it. It's going to just be more socially acceptable. Um, and according to NIH, that's a problem for one in six kids. It's not a problem for everybody, but it can be a problem on the roads and, and for IQ and learning, et cetera. So the administration's been very clear that they're going to be against it. What the Justice Department does with the very tricky legal questions, because each of these initiatives, you know, have like 10 different legal things that they're trying to do. I think is the is the more interesting question you know uh, federal law is federal law I can't imagine the administration is going to say um, it's going to be okay with retail sales uh, you might be able to have people grow their own and really with the resources out there there's nothing you can do about it even if it's against federal law but I you know I think uh, Hickenlooper the governor of Colorado was right when he said not to break out the Cheetos just yet uh, because you know there's there's a lot that needs to be ironed out here I'm glad you brought that up first of all I want to yeah. uh, the, the, the NIH studies and the sort yeah, of negative sure. consequences I think um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting data on this, right? There's been some data that finds essentially no effect. There's, some, there's been some data that finds um, some negative effects in developmentally, depending on when kids smoke marijuana. Um, but also, it all has to be compared to alcohol, right? Because, I mean, in some ways, that, that becomes a big issue. I mean, even if there are negative effects, there's lots of negative effects of alcohol. We know that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but I mean, alcohol is legal because it has a cultural history, widespread accepted use. I mean, marijuana has well, it's also legal. Years, it's also but, legal. It's also legal because yeah. we tried to ban it, and it was the biggest policy disaster, arguably, except for slavery. Yeah, but it was decriminalized <laughs> when it was prohibited. Actually, for alcohol prohibition, it was actually decriminalized. You could actually possess it. You just couldn't buy it. Um, there are some parallels with prohibition. I mean, actually, um, cirrhosis of the liver went down during prohibition. There were some public health gains. I, I'm not saying that the issue is current policy is not perfect. I think that's the bottom line with marijuana. The issue, though, that the war on drugs is a failure and current policy isn't perfect, so then we should legalize. I think that's been the narrative in the media, the sort of false dichotomy is what I would call it. We can do a lot of other things, like not target Hispanics and blacks when it comes to arrests, not saddle people with records for their, so they can't get a college loan. Mm -hmm. Let's change those things. The idea, though, that we want to treat this like alcohol and tobacco, have an industry that sells to kids, have an industry that, that this is commercialized, I don't see why we have to go the, so far. The case for marijuana needs to be made on its own, not uh, by saying it's better than, than alcohol. I mean, that's a, that's a case against alcohol. It's not a case for marijuana. Right, exactly. Right. You look like you wanted to jump in. Well, I, which, you know, this notion of the health effects, I mean, 
Chris made the point, it's also cigarettes. So I cigarettes agree. are legal, but uh, we're not allowed to sell them to kids. Yeah. Um, we regulate them in ways. Uh, the government actually recovers 66% of the profits on a pack of cigarettes, right. and we regulate. Now, I don't want my kids smoking yeah. cigarettes, and we've made it illegal. So I think you're right. I think the way this is going to happen is that states are going to start innovating as they are, and eventually that's going to put pressure. For every dollar in cigarette for every dollar we get in cigarette or alcohol taxes, we spend 10 in social costs. I'm not, I'm not equating but, marijuana with cigarettes yes, in those but, ways, but, but we have to look at that. But yes, but actually what we've done by making it harder to smoke in public yeah. places and by increasing the cost of cigarettes through taxation right. is that we've actually seen a great reduction in yep. the take up of cigarettes yep. by young people. A quarter people. of Americans so we smoke. Have actually right. have, but we, so we've actually impacted yeah. attitudes Should, and behaviors. Th th this idea of the yeah. industry is, yeah. is, is, is fascinating, right? Huge. Because right now the, the big open question is, A, what is the federal government going to do? But also, what does a marijuana industry look like? And I'm glad you, you raised that and, and, and you you also had the Doritos line because I think one of the things that has kind of made this a difficult conversation is that people joke about it, right? It's like marijuana is funny. Um, this is President, when we come back, sure. President Obama at a town hall when he's making his argument not in favor of legalizing marijuana in 2009. We're going we're to see that clip and then you're going to talk about what the marijuana industry looks like and what its future is after this break. I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high. Uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. And uh, uh, I don't know what this says about the online audience, but, <laughs> but I, I just want, uh, I don't want people to think that uh, this was a fairly popular question. We want to make sure that it was answered. Uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. President Barack Obama, formerly of the Chum Gang, uh, jo joking, about, <laughs> joking about marijuana legalization. Uh, Tony, one of the things that's great about the, your reporting, which I just want to plug for everyone, has been phenomenal on this, and everyone uh, should you. read it. They should also read uh, the reporting from Ryan Grimm and, and his great book. Uh, um, is that it's not that, that we are in the process now of migrating from the let's say, the Chum Gang and Doritos era to the, the sort of industrialized era, the right. professional era. Um, what does that look like on the ground in these states? Uh, well, okay, so Colorado, which is where I focus most of my reporting, has the only for-profit marijuana market in the world currently, uh, from, from wholesale straight through to the stores with the retail model. You need a doctor's recommendation, easy to get. So it's basically what Washington State is going to set up only now. And uh, it's Big Brother. I mean, the regulations are incredibly tight. It's 280 pages of, of notes, uh, cameras in every room, uh, badges for every employee, uh, little uh, tags on every single plant. So you, like, you have to account for everything. Every leaf, every stem, there's no diversion. Uh, and, and I think if you did a cut and paste of the Colorado model uh, and, and put it in, into play in Washington State, you would have a pretty, really good basis for uh, what many people think will be the future of, of marijuana legalization. But to your point, it, there is an interesting clash of cultures because all these big businesses that are now profiting in, in Colorado, all the talent is de facto talent developed under prohibition, right? So you have like, right. the morning commute is guys in suits walking the buildings and right behind them is guys in sweatpants and like the spiderweb pattern caps and you know <laughs> Dorito dust on their fingers. Right, it's, right. It's stoners and, and investors side by side. And that will change eventually, but not for not for the near term. Yeah, yeah and what we've seen actually is that as, as recently as the 70s when we were sort of going on the path to decriminalization at that time as well, uh, the tobacco companies, we have evidence that they were actually interested in getting into this issue. There's a consultant's report to Brown and Williamson in mid-70s that said, you know, we have the fields to grow it, we have the tractors to roll it, we're, you know, we're ready to go. Um, uh, we have trademarks of marijuana that we could easily transfer to be legal trademarks if we have legalized marijuana. So I think this, I mean, there are a lot of scary things that have been said about marijuana. Some of it unjustified, and I'm not here to justify all those things that have been said, but some of them I think are justified. And one of them, you know, one of those issues is this issue of big industry. The idea that we're not going to have a tobacco industry targeting to kids that systematically lied for 80 years yeah. uh, to kids, and by the way, said that cigarettes are medicine and had doctors on, in their ads, which is a very interesting parallel. Or an alcohol industry. I mean, I worked in Washington. The alcohol industry is huge. They fight every tax increase, mm -hmm. tooth and nail. Right. And so, and they downplay. Beer ads are good because they're meant to hook kids. Right. And the idea we're not going to have this for marijuana business. So, yeah. 
Well, I just think that I, I totally agree with you, and I think your earlier point about decriminalization is extremely important here because there is a huge economic impact to criminalization in terms of the number of people who are incarcerated, their impact on their abilities to get a job afterward. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to diminish that point, and, I've, and it is a very tough issue. But I think if we look at it on the other side, you know, there's so much social science data that shows that one of the best ways to control behavior is to find ways to limit it out in the open. I mean, this is my point about cigarette smoking right. and its impact on reducing right. um, young people's taking up cigarettes. And so I just think we need to look at well, that. Take, yeah, DJ. Well, yeah, a piece I want to pick up on that Maya had mentioned is, you know, my cons one concern I have is that the whole question about legalization or of marijuana can kind of overshadow the kind of sub issues we're talking about. Like, cause I think we, there is a lot of important issues about the overcriminalization of drug use and, and the effects that it has on and particularly people. Particularly disproportionate effects it has on Black and Latino young absolutely. men here in New York City, for no, instance. No, no, California. I, absolutely, and 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 dealing with the, you know the actual health issues because cause, cause sometimes I think the debate is like well legalization it's kind of like we were talking about earlier it's like cutting taxes will solve all problems legalization could solve all problems instead of really looking at it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker That's the right. idea we want to create this like a health issue but w w we have cancer like a health issue would we would we say if somebody has early stage cancer like oh we're just going to give them a hundred dollar fine and forget about it no we do an assessment we'd look at if they actually have a health issue so I think Wait, but, this, but the thing I think that's, that, that's key here right is that like we are going to we're running the experiment now I mean that I think yeah. is yeah. The, right. the, I, right, we've had been having this debate in the abstract. I mean, we're going to run this experiment. I mean, one of the things here, I think, two things. One is what I find fascinating about the Colorado thing is that it's as much a test of setting up a new regulatory regime as it is a test of legalizing marijuana and prohibition, right? I mean, the question is, is there going to be a huge black market that's going to emerge? Are you going to have, is this going to spiral out of control? Well, I actually think there will be, uh, and the tax projections in Washington State are really rosy, really rosy. Those sound pretty, I got to say, I, mean, like, I did not like do a hard study, but $600 million a year sounds really high. I mean, and 25% and at the retail end, um, I mean, if you're talking, right now, ounces are going for $250, $300. That's going to come down some, but even if it's $100, ounce at the store, a $25 tax? I mean, Canada had to repeal a cigarette tax that was $5 a pack in the 90s. Because of evasion. Because of evasion, right? You know, um, and, 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 and marijuana is already something that people know how to use on the black market. It's already a black market market. So uh, evasion is going to be widespread. I, I don't think it's going to be a, a tax winner. And, what, what, and so how, how are they attacking that problem? I mean, in Colorado, I mean, it sounds like th that, that's why you call it a big brother regime, because they're, they're precisely afraid of that eventuality. Yes. I mean, they're, they're attacking it by there, there's zero room to operate outside of the purview of the, the, the law, of law enforcement. But it's important to note that none of the projections for the medical market in Colorado have been met. Uh, the revenue proje projections. The, the Office of uh, Enforcement in charge of regulating the industry has not is underfunded. They had to ask for extra funds from the state to That's pay for it. So there were, there were tax revenue projections when, the, when they were making the, the argument yeah, about when, medical marijuana. Right, right. The idea was, you know, we're going to have X number of, of, of customers, X number of stores, and these are going to be the fees, and we're going to pay for all these, um, you know, all you know, all these cars and everything, and it didn't work out. Well, well, one of the things that's interesting is that the, one of the predictions, the medical marijuana, of course, was always, the, you know, was seen as the camel's nose under the tent, right? This was the first way of getting to it. Um, this is Barry McCaffrey in 1996 after California and Arizona legalized medical marijuana. Um, we're now going to see this come up all over the country, and this is not paranoia on my part. This is a national legalization of drug strategy. In other words, I see this not as two medical initiatives dealing with the terminal ill, I see this as part of the national effort to legalize drugs, starting with marijuana all over the United States. He's exactly right. He was exactly right. <laughs> now the question becomes, there's, there's the question of the effect in terms of the regulatory perspective and the, and the taxes, but I want to talk about what the social effect is going to be and what, what does this look like and what the consumption of the drug is going to look like, what normalizing it uh, might look like right after we take this break. Are we about to enter a week that we will remember as the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. I think in some ways that's the question. And I think it's worthwhile going back to the genesis, the creation myth of the war on drugs. Much of it really started by Richard Nixon as part of a kind of culture war politics toolbox. Um, we've got some great tape of Richard Nixon talking about the issue from the Nixon tapes, which, can I just say about the Nixon tapes, you think you know the best parts, but there's just always better stuff in there. This is Nixon in 1971 talking to Bob Haldeman uh, about marijuana. Take a listen. Right. 
So I want to hit it square in the puss. I want to hit against legalizing all that sort of thing. We've edited out the part in which he speculates uh, in an anti-Semitic fashion about the relationship between Jewish lawmakers yeah. and support for legalization. Not existed as we, far as we, I can we, tell. We, 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 we've edited that out. But that's you know that's the place where this is where this is coming from. And I think some of the skepticism against the war on drugs is born of the fact that it was sold in this incredibly um, cynical way. You're right. There's a lot of cultural baggage with this. And so, uh, obviously, mistakes have been made in the past. I mean, That's a Nixon phrase. You know, I, it's true. I, I, I actually, you know, so, so, but instead of, instead of figuring out all this, you know, this cultural stuff, let's just look at today. Let's look at the health. Let's look at the data and not make... I know a lot of people have baggage from Vietnam and anti-Nixon, pro-Nixon, pro-marijuana, hippie, this and that. It's a lot of baggage that people come with, but I think it's time... I think Americans have grown up. Let's have a real conversation about so, this. Well, okay, so the real conversation is now, right? So one of the things is, is consumption going to increase? I mean, are we going to see more people smoking marijuana in these states? Okay, so first of all, the United States already smokes three times the amount of marijuana that the rest of the world does. Is that true? It's true. We are Wait, the rate of in total or per capita? No, per capita. The percentage of Americans really? who smoke marijuana, three times the global average. Yeah, three times the global average. How yeah. do we smoke so much weed? We do a lot of things at three times the global <laughs> average. <laughs> but can we just say one thing on that point, yeah, yeah. which is black and Latinos do not smoke at the same rate as whites. So there, there are also racial differences in consumption. Mm -hmm. you were going to say about that? Oh, well, so, I mean, I, the floodgates, I believe, will open when legalization is here in these states, and then as it expands, I, you're going to see a, at least a doubling and likely more. I mean, that, that's not only my opinion. I mean, that's the opinion based on, you know, economists believe the same thing to be true. Well, how, how could it not be true? I mean, when I ask myself, would I ha smoke marijuana if it were available at the corner store? Yeah. If I were having a party and it was available and I could pick it up, yes, I would buy it. And, and that decision will be replicated out millions of times around the country. It's advertising access and availability. Again, it doesn't mean that there aren't things that we can do about current policy to make it better, to, to improve the health issue. Um, you know, we treat cancer like health. We intervene early. Let's do the same with drugs. Wait, so, yeah. so uh, if, if this consumption increases, I mean, I think this gets to an interesting part of the of the public opinion around this, which is that um, one of the arguments I think progressives make um, about decriminalization or legalization has to do with um, the way in which the war on drugs is waged, right? And particularly the disparate impact it has, particularly on black and Latino uh, uh, citizens. But public opinion on legalization in particularly African-American communities, my understanding is quite different than what it is in, in uh, among whites. In fact, it's lower. And I, I'm curious, um, as someone from the NAACP, um, whether you've seen this up close. Is this something that the organization has been talking about? Well, I mean, clearly, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of discussion around the issue. But I think, I mean, clearly, there's a separation, right? I mean, you can talk about a war on drugs, but there's different types of wars you can have. And if the war on drugs is mass incarceration, our community has suffered so much from that, I think our community stands very strong about the uh, negative effects of criminalization of the war on drugs and the mass incarceration. But then there's the issue of should you have a war on drugs, which our community is also very much for as a public health issue, right. as something that is That's hurting really your community, that is tearing apart. So we have incarceration tearing us apart with the official war on drugs, and then we have drugs tearing apart our community. And so you can, you can have a more nuanced conversation about it and be adamant about it. I think that's why you see in public opinion polls, African Americans don't just flock to legalization because we know drugs have a very negative effect as well. I, I think that's really important because it, public opinion is formed by people's experiences. And if your experience is that you're getting slammed by the cop, mm -hmm. I mean, I, my daughter and her friends can't stand out on the street in front of their apartment building because the cops are going to come and harass them, right? Just for standing out in front of their own apartment building. Um, plus, you have the fact that there are very serious drugs in communities of color that are ravaging not just the health, but the fabric of families. So, of course, opinion is going to run on any drug in, in the black and I think Latino communities as well. On any drug, I mean. So, but the consumption is much, much lower. The consumption will probably go up. I mean, one of the things that would be very interesting to see is how does consumption change in Colorado, which you know Denver does have black folk and it does have Latinos. You know, I've been there. I've seen them. Um, and you know, so so and they've got four, five, and up to thirteen times the incarceration rates, even when they have lower usage. Right. What happens there? So I think your right. point of this experiment is it's going to be important to look at race in the experiment. Hold, hold both those. Thoughts. Quick break. We're going to come back. Um, we're talking about marijuana legalization, particularly in the context of this kind of progressive, I think, absolutely substantively correct critique of the way the war on drugs has been ha has been waged. Here's just marijuana arrest by administration from Nixon to Obama, and this is one of the things about the the 
the war on drugs, that it goes up and up and up, although through 2010, um, it's, it's, it's down quite a bit in the Obama administration. Um, that's at the federal level, of course. But if you look at data at the local level, it just goes up and, and up and up. And I think one of the questions is, are we going to see... This, if this is the solution to the kind of disparate impacts that we've seen in the war on drugs, are we going to see in Colorado and in Washington um, this be the solution to that? Yeah, I'm not convinced. I think there are two important points to make uh, about the arrest. The first is, yes, 750,000 people a year uh, are arrested on marijuana possession charges, but very few of those people actually end up in prison. They're not sentenced, right? So fewer than 400 people are in state or federal prison right now for marijuana possession alone. Now, you can argue that's too many, it should be zero, but it, it's not the uh, prison clearing solution. Uh, let, me, let me just make one point about that, because I think this is an important thing to think about, and, and, and it comes out of some of the work. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's actually doing graduate work on this. It, 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 misdemeanor arrests and early arrests are a way of marking um, particularly young, point two. young African American and Latino people, and that right. So even if they don't end up in prison, right, you now you bear the mark of the of the criminal justice system, right. and that can happen. So so point two is okay. So will <laughs> I'm the, just taking your second point. I'm sorry. So will, will, will black and Latino uh, young people no longer bear this mark under legalization? Not evident to me that they will avoid arrest or avo avoid hassle by the police because because. It's still illegal if you're under 21. Most people smoke marijuana well before 21. Right, right. And, and secondly, it's illegal to smoke outdoors in both Colorado and Washington State. It will be. And, and we know that the consumption patterns in, in African American communities are different from in white communities, right? Yeah. It's not the basement uh, uh, smoke session. It's, right. it's the stoop or it's the yeah. park. We don't right. have a basement. Right. Right. And, and, as, and as Ma was pointing out, I mean, if you already have African Americans taking, you know, smoking less marijuana, you know, relative to the population size, and we're still getting incarcerated, I guess my point I want to get it is that. That's not going to end the problem of over incarceration for African Americans if you legalize all drugs because we get arrested for misdemeanor charges for standing outside our own yeah. you know, right, apartments right. and these types of things. The other big driver of marijuana arrest, even when legalization is here, is going to be the enforcement uh, of busts, right? So you get pulled over, cops wants to, wants to hassle you, finds marijuana in the car, gives you, you know, sobriety test, you go to jail anyway, or, uh, um, you know, like you're at a concert, you're outside, you're carrying slightly too much. I mean, Cops are still in the process of enforcing legalization, going to have a lot of discretion about who to bust. And let's remember, institutional memory and institutional reflexes here are incredibly important in any institution. Yeah. If you're a police officer, a 42-year-old police mm -hmm. officer, you've spent 15, 20 years busting people for marijuana. It's going to be a very weird thing uh, to turn on a dime. Extremely weird. I, so Although, are we pretending that cops don't smoke? <laughs> no, no, we should not pretend that. So, so I think alcohol and marijuana are different. So they, they, can, they are instructive in so far as the ad, marijuana advocates have said, let's set up a system like alcohol. Right. We, should, we should make ideas. That was so, one of the explicit arguments. Right, right. right. So when you look at that, um, alcohol is responsible for a million more arrests a year than all drugs combined. Huh. 2.6 million arrests a year. So this idea that it's going to be no longer an issue yeah. doesn't make sense. Also, we've seen, again, how the alcohol industry has relentlessly targeted the inner city. When you look at liquor outlet density yeah. in the inner city and in black and Hispanic communities versus white communities, there's no comparison. That's why you have these community action groups where their number one drug issue is alcohol, which right. is legal. Mm -hmm. So not going to solve our problems. Let's focus on health issues rather than legal. Tony, you were saying uh, uh, about the way that the, the police are preparing for this. Was I? <laughs> well, no, you were saying that, that, I mean, how are the police uh, preparing for this? Uh, oh, well, in, in Washington, the police are trying to figure out um, what their policy will be on things such as uh, members of the force smoking. Uh, and they are waiting along with the legislators in Washington to find out what the market's going to look like. I love that the Liquor Control Board in Washington State is uh, allocating funds to hire a marijuana expert to come in and tell them, like, what is marijuana? Where do people currently buy it? Uh, so it's going to be an entertaining process. In Colorado, when they had something similar to set up their market, you had drum circles outside and then sort of business people in suits like the sharks in the water coming in and like the drum circle people were spitting on the business people. And like, <laughs> it's a, the, the social clashes that will develop uh, in the process of legalizing are going to be entertaining. Tony DeCobel from Newsweek and the Daily Beast and Kevin Sabet, former senior advisor for the Obama Office of National Drug Control Policy. That was really, really enlightening conversation. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Chris. What you should know for the Newsweek ahead, coming up next.